make sure we're on time. Okay, right on time, perfect. Hello, um, and welcome to a special presentation. Can everybody hear me all right? Speak, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the creator of Mobile Suit Gundam, um, like the, the primary creator, because all creative endeavors are collaborative enterprises, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know that spiel. Um, I'll, I'll probably mention it a few times anyways. Um, I'm uh, Ethan Hawker. Sometimes um, I don't know if I see any familiar faces, but uh, I do guest lecture work at Webster University on Japanese animation in particular. Um, that's my sort of area of expertise, um, particularly like very old Japanese animation, like pre Astro Boy, Tatsuan Atumu kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I get to talk about something fun for once uh, robot cartoons, which I'm a huge fan of. I love Mobile Suit Gundam and, and Yoshiyuki Tomino in particular, getting into the subject at hand, which is uh, what is a Yoshiyuki Tomino? Um, he's a lot of things. He's primarily known as a series director, but he's also an animation director, um, a series director, obviously, and a director of individual episodes for several series. That's really how he got his, got his start um, before, you know, taking on larger projects. Uh, a script writer, um, manga author, not artist, but an author, um, as well as just a regular author of novels. A lyricist under a pseudonym. Um, the uh, novelist, again, uh, the Gundam novels are in English, too, if you ever want to read them. They're wild. Uh, there's a protracted scene involving a weird space ritual where um, people give, uh, like, lockets with their pubic hair um, as, like, gifts for good luck. Uh, and Amaro asks Sela for a locket full of uh, her pubic hair, and she rightfully says no, um, because Yoshiyuki Tamino is an absolute freak, uh, just a madman. Um, uh, and probably one of the most significant creative minds anima in anime today. Uh, Gundam alone is such a tremendous feather in his hat, but he's also sort of the father of like the modern isekai anime with Aura Battler Dunbine in uh, 1983. Um, Zabungle heavily influences Garen Lagan, uh, the 1982 Z Zabungle series. Uh, just a bunch of stuff, but um, we're going to get into sort of the nuts and bolts of that early period. Um, discussing his actual youth. Um, Born in 1941, you know, just as uh, as Japan is embroiled in sort of World War II, um, a very middle class family, which is you know sort of a rare privilege at this point in time. Um, upper middle class might be a more accurate description. Um, his father Kihei Tomino is conscripted during the Second World War. He does not want to fight. Uh, he's he does uh, work as a chemical engineer, so he's not a frontline sort of infantryman type. Um, uh, it profoundly changes his experience. Uh, this, this balloon is not a profound change of that experience, but it is something I, I think is interesting um, in that if you know Tomino, there's this constant thing of decoy balloons showing up in his work, um, like, like asteroids that aren't actually asteroids, um, that sort of thing, or these, these delightful things, which they finally made toys of recently. Um, and, and part of that uh, is, this is purely hypothesis, this is conjecture, but his father, one of his projects was uh, balloons with fire bombs uh, in the Second World War that would be used against um, Allied soldiers, and I, I always wondered if this was kind of a response to that. This is again, this is educated conjecture. He hasn't officially said anything on this, but uh, I just wanted to throw out my crackpot theory there um, because I think it's very fun and very Tomino. Uh, because um, as will as you will see, uh, he has a lot of daddy issues um, that crop up in his work a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, uh, schooling is sort of a fraught experience for him. Uh, he doesn't have a great time with it. Um, and he has an interest in art. He is a good artist. He always disparages his ability as, as an artist because he's not an animator. Uh, but the man can draw, and that's sort of a hugely significant reason and why he ended up becoming a director, as you will see. Um, uh, college years, uh, this is sort of where he you know, forms his person, like with most people, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> college is a pretty formative experience. Um, he attends Nihon University's College of Art uh, as, do, as a sort of film studies type. Uh, barely attends his first two years. He mostly goes to, his, goes to see movies, um, which I can relate to as an also film major, though I did make it to more of my classes maybe. Um, but uh, he sees two very significant films in this period. He, he sees 2001 Space Odyssey uh, as well, to be good, or, well, later on and that sort of thing. But in this period, uh, there are really two really big science fiction films, which are uh, Destination Moon and Forbidden Planet. Um, Destination Moon is kind of important because of the way it depicts gravity. It, it famously has like some of the earliest sequences of trying to depict like zero gravity in film. Um, Forbidden Planet is, um, I guess, relevant enough to like now Gundam uh, with G Witch. Um, who here is watching G Witch right now? Witch and Mercury. Um, well, uh, Lady Prospera, uh, you know Prospero's books and uh, The Tempest in particular. Uh, Forbidden Planet is a science fiction retelling of The Tempest. Um, so it all comes back to. 
The Tempest. It's always Billy Shakespeare for some reason. Um, but Forbidden Planet, uh, a big thing uh, that crops up in it is uh, we see here in this brief sequence of animation, the creature from the id. Um, so in, in Forbidden Planet, sort of the big monster is a manifestation of like psychic evil um, from a major character in the film. Uh, and so lasers, etc. cetera, uh, in this very impressive sequence of animation. Um, and this is a common thing you'll see in a lot of Tomino works, particularly the original Mobile Suit Gundam, um, seen here, uh, I guess light spoilers, but uh, in the aftermath of the confrontation with Big Zam, we see all of uh, Dozel Zabi's uh, malicious energy manifesting in a very literal sense, um, which I, that's always been my takeaway for what he got out of Forbidden Planet, um, is that very like physical manifestation of the psychic, along with a lot of, you know, sort of like 60s stuff, Devil Man, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm trying to cover a lot of ground. I, I do apologize. If you ever have any questions or anything, I, I have time at the very end as well. But if there's like just a really burning question, just raise your hand. Um, I do like lecture work with students, so I try to be as open as possible to that. Oh, you're making good time. Thank God. Um, so Mushi Productions. Um, in 1961, uh, Osamu Tezuka, um, and everybody here knows Osamu Tezuka, right? Just making sure. Um, <laughs> well, uh, just a quick overview is um, he's the best known as the creator of Astro Boy, the sort of the god of manga type. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll always see him with like the beret and the big glasses and kind of the big funny, funny nose uh, if you see like caricatures of him. But yeah, he did uh, Kimba the White Lion, uh, Princess Knight, Blackjack amongst many, many other things. But he also founded an animation studio, the first like major television animation house in Japan. Um, and in 1963, Astro Boy uh, premieres on television and is a big hit. Everybody loves it. Uh, it premieres on literally the first day in 1963 too, uh, January 1st. Um, in uh, 1964, Tomino, sort of fresh out of college and looking for work. There's not a whole lot of work in the Japanese film industry at this point, uh, but the animation industry is booming uh, in response to Astro Boy's success. You've already seen new studios like TCJ drop up and uh, Toei, the sort of uh, progenitor of this whole boom in its way, is shifting into television animation as well. So there's lots of work to be had in this space. Um, uh, he starts off as a production assistant and scriptwriter there. Um, the thing is uh, to keep in mind at Mushi Pro, um, it wasn't like at Toei. At Toei, there was like a very strict delineation between directors and animators. Uh, in Mushi Pro, animators run the ha ran the house, uh, par partially because Tezuka was an artist himself, and so he lionized other good artists. Um, uh, and the vast majority of people who would become episode directors on uh, Mighty Adam were animators. They started off as animators. Uh, the sole exception is one Yoshiyuki Tamino, um, because he is good at drawing. I, as you will see, I prepared a special thing just for the class. Um, and he debuts on in the third core, I believe, uh, of Mighty Adam with the episode Robot Future, um, which was adapted to, into the American series as episode 87, The Great Rocket Robbery. What a good title. Um, and I have prepared a little something here, actually. Oh yeah, He's all, he also goes on to be the most prolific episode director on Mighty Adam, um, directing 25 of its episodes total. But I have prepared a little thing.
Clearly, he was not as bad of an artist as he always claims. Those storyboards are very much on par with um, what Tezuka would do whenever he would come in to do storyboard work on the show. Um, so again, you know, a pretty adept artist um, and already has a fairly good command of like cinematic storytelling, basically, just in terms of the angles and that sort of thing um, that will sort of exemplify uh, modern anime moving forward. Um, uh, but after Mighty Adam, he technically goes freelance. He still works with Mushi Productions. Um, that, that's the thing is Tomino has always been freelance, quote unquote. Um, but he does a lot of work with like Sunrise, uh, basically exclusively Sunrise. But he's never he's always claims that he's like um, working outside of that space technically. Um, it basically just means he's a contract worker, so he doesn't have union benefits. Which yeah, that's that's sort of the animation anime industry as a whole uh, in general. That's a whole other sort of panel, though. Um, uh, he works on other stuff, uh, like the Mushi Pro series uh, Dororo, um, which was adapted into a new show in 2018, I want to say. Um, a pretty good uh, show, uh, but the 1969 one is very significant. It's part of the first like wave of uh, anime works for more mature audiences, uh, Gekiga, as they're called. Um, uh, he's uh, primarily an episode director and storyboard artist at this point in time. Uh, storyboards are just called Ikante, so just... Uh, Sometimes I'll use them interchangeably, uh, as worth noting. Um, uh, during this time, he does storyboards for Isao Takahata's Heidi uh, and Anne of Green Gables. These are boards from Anne of Green Gables. Um, if you look them up, like a lot of his boards were very sort of viciously corrected by uh, both Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki. So if you ever hear um, uh, Tomino uh, complaining or talking about how he will destroy Hayao Miyazaki as he does, he, he's very hyperbolic a lot of the time. Um, that's usually partially why is because they were they were mean to him back in the day um though he also freely admits that he learned a lot under them so uh, it's probably just a little bit of both tomino can't be trusted in interviews or like his memoirs and that sort of thing like he's um sometimes he just lies sometimes he forgets things um but he always just goes kind of goes for the most hyperbolic sort of thing again because he's a delightful weirdo um uh, he direct, boards and directs several episodes of a bunch of Tatsunoko shows, um, including, um, appropriately enough, y Yataman, uh, the creator of G Gundam, uh, when he was making the Windmill Gundam, which is what I have a shirt of. That's, that's what this was. was he, was, uh, he actually evoked uh, Yataman. That's what he was thinking of when he made the Windmill Gundam. So a connection to G Gundam and the larger Tomino oeuvre, despite G Gundam generally being you know, a completely different sort of thing. What? Yeah, uh, that might be meaningless to some of you, but if you watch the original Mobile Suit Gundam, uh, you'll remember the Black Tri Stars and their sort of an infamous uh, jet stream attack. Uh, that's sort of this is sort of the very first instance of that cropping up in his work. He loves it. The, the Black Tri Stars. He just literally recycles the name and everything in Dunbar, and it's delightful. Um, uh, and finally, he helms his very first. Uh, work as a series director, and this will actually be his uh, only non-mecha television series, like long-form television series in his entire canon. Um, this is his very first. <laughs> What a pretty show. Triton of the Sea, um, another uh, adaptation of Orosamu Tezuka work, uh, funnily enough. Uh, Yoshinobu Nishizaki sort of infamously just kind of stole the rights to this from uh, Tezuka. Uh, Yoshinobu Nishizaki is an insane person. Uh, he's dead now, actually, so I guess he was an insane person. Uh, but most infamously, he um, basically, he, like, he got arrested for having a large accumulation of uh, cocaine and firearms, um, including a grenade launcher. Um, when, when his bus was raided, uh, he had a boat, I believe, that was raided that had all this. Um, yeah, he had a lot of drug money. Uh, infamously, he like kind of threatened, uh, sort of halfway threatened, like, yeah, uh, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko um, to work on a project of his. Uh, just a real character, <laughs> I will say. Um, but uh, this was his first sort of foray, uh, splintering off of Mushi Productions. Um, uh, very loosely adapted um, from that original manga by Tezuka. Um, 
the aesthetic's different. It's not quite so rounded. Um, the designs are futzed with, mar largely to avoid any sort of infringement on Tezuka's larger IP, uh, pretty much, because they didn't want it to be too close. They didn't want to give him an excuse for litigation further after he'd already kind of scooped up the rights to this ad adaptive property. Uh, you sort of see something like that with like the giant robo OVAs versus the old giant robo manga in Tokusatsu from the 60s and 70s versus the anime from the 90s. Um, though that one is a lot less malicious um, and more like a love letter to the original material. Um, uh, Tezuka, or, uh, Tomino also says that he heavily rewrote it because he thought the original manga was boring. Uh, again, it's, it's difficult to tell if that's um, Tomino being um, just ostentatious uh, or just being kind of blunt uh, in general. Uh, so it's largely, you know, what you'd expect for the day. Boy hero battles um, an evil race called the Poseidons. Uh, or maybe they aren't villainous. Huh, that's a thing. Uh, it's a major, sort of the very start of um, his, like, really downbeat kind of bummer endings. Um, if you know Yoshiki Tamino, you know that, like, uh, if you're familiar with Zeta Gundam um, or, like, Ideon, um, uh, his endings are generally up until like brain powered um, where they generally get a lot happier uh, they're pretty downbeat as a whole large swaths of the cast if not the entire cast get killed off um uh, and this is sort of the start of that um their major revelation is that the poseidons are actually um like people who were uh basically like slaughtered by the um uh triton people uh, of which you know triton is a member of that, that clan um so it's it, the big the big twist at the end is the leader of the Poseidons is like you killed my family what the hell dude um, not great um, but you know it sort of ushers in this larger wave of kind of more downbeat uh, anime and so again it's sort of representative of that Gekiga boom of more downbeat stories um, uh, Nishizaki and Tomino have a falling out pretty soon after. Uh, this is a result of Tomino heavily revising scripts um, for the series Space Battleship Yamato, which uh, some of you may know as uh, Star Blazers, um, as it was adapted for the U.S. in the late 70s. Um, but yeah, uh, Tomino got in trouble for doing a bunch of that, because when you get the script and then you do the storyboards for the show, you can actually futz with the, the lines and everything quite a bit. That's actually a thing Tomino does a lot. Um, because in a lot of his shows, like Gundam, the original Mobile Suit Gundam, he only writes one episode, but he storyboards a substantial chunk of them. Um, and he usually used that as a way of sort of rewriting and filling in whatever details he wanted to. Um, but uh, then he had an opportunity to do a whole new project, a robot cartoon to compete with Mazinger. Writing, uh, very writing. Um, uh, it was created, uh, this is his second series, you know, after a brief break uh, in between projects, um, partially made in response to Mazinger Z's popularity. Uh, it's big sort of um, twist, I suppose, is that it's mystically themed rather than being a product of science. Uh, the uh, eponymous robot is an artifact of the lost continent of Mu, um, which our hero uh, pilots. Uh, the robot is designed to actually transform, unlike Getter Robo, um, or like earlier robots where it was just like a bunch of jet planes that slammed into each other um, and then suddenly somehow made a robot. Um, the thing about Raideen is that it could actually transform. Hey, there you go. Uh, it turns into the godbird so that the to it matched up more with the toys. Um, and it actually makes it to the U.S. It's the first super robot cartoon to ever come over here. Uh, it would air um, with in, in Japanese with English subtitles um, on a number of like eight... Um, like networks marketed specifically at East Asian viewers, particularly you know, Japanese ones, obviously in Hawaii, but also in Chicago and uh, limited distribution in New York. It's one of several shows uh, distributed by, I believe, Kiku TV, along with Captain Harlock and a few others. Um, so yeah, Tomino has been sort of making it over here ever since then. Uh, it's also was part of the Shogun Warriors toy line and was featured in a Marvel comic book. Uh, Shogun Warriors had a Marvel comic tie-in um, where it's completely unrelated to the actual shows, they just used the robot designs. Um, but uh, Raideen, Combatler V, and Dangard Ace were both in that and fight the Fantastic Four at some point. How fun. Um, uh, Tomino only directs the first half of the show um, and he's kicked out uh, because the sponsors don't like the, the magic stuff, they think it's dumb. Um, and he's replaced with uh, Tadao Nagahama, who's uh, an important dude. 
Uh, here comes Sharkeen. I love that. I love that pun. Uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. Um, uh, he's the the, the willowy be shonen guy in writing, um, sort of starting a trend of the importance of stuff, of that sort of thing in mecha works. Um, uh, he'll influence a lot of later Nagahama villains, um, and he's basically the prototype for Shar. Those other Nagahama villains kind of build upon this this archetype, but he's sort of like the enemy ace rival character, um, by and large. Uh, hugely popular with young women. Uh, the Fujoshis go absolutely mad over this man um, and, and ship him and the uh, lead character. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, just an ongoing magazine. It's a, a lot of this car carryover is from Yamato, the Yamato crowd, um, who you know shipped a lot of these characters. That was a big thing, yeah, uh, fan shipping and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, Fujoshi's have been hugely significant in the popularization of, of stuff uh, forever. Uh, Tomino always, whenever he's interviewed about Gundam's success, uh, he, he generally says, "If it wasn't for the, the women uh, watching my show, um, it wouldn't have. They wouldn't have let us make the Gundam movies." Um, as much as, you know, model kits are sort of pushed forward. Uh, so similar to sort of like the U.S. situation with Star Trek, I suppose. Um, uh, the designs are done by uh, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko. This man, what a delightful man. He still does stuff. He directed uh, the um, Kukuro's Dawn's Island film that just came out last year um, and is still writing manga and everything. Uh, what a nice guy. Apparently one time he and Tomino got in a fist fight, um, which is the subject for a completely different panel. Uh, but it's uh, just a delightful thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but uh, just a brief aside, discussing those Nagahama shows, uh, he made a trilogy, the, the Robot Romance Trilogy. Um, and these are kind of parallel stories. You know how, um, like, I don't know, art isn't made in a vacuum kind of thing. Uh, I, I kind of try to emphasize that when I'm, I'm lecturing. Um, but he makes these shows, Combatler V, Voltes V, uh, and Tosho Daimos, which all kind of have those uh, willowy book be shown in types, um, usually with some sort of tragic end. Uh, usually, um, these the later two uh, products of aristocracy, um, and you know that sort of informs uh, the larger characterization of Shar. Um, it, it it's all a lot of influence more from again coming back to like stuff that was initially marketed towards women. Um, uh, it's a lot of influence from like shoujo manga, particularly when you get into the aristocrats and that sort of thing. There's a lot of historical sort of fiction. Uh, Rosa Versailles uh, and Ryoko Ikeda's larger body of work um, are informed by this, or inform this sort of character. Uh, but Tomino is allowed to do a new show. Zambot 3 uh, is the first anime produced by Sunrise. At this point, um, Sunrise was a, largely a support studio, like even on writing, which they're sometimes credited for. That was a, a different studio that actually did that. Um, but Sunrise wants to get into the making cartoons and also lots of money on merchandising game. Uh, so they make a, a deal with the toy manufacturer Clover, uh, famous for kind of crummy toys, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, it's a major departure from previous Super Robot shows. Uh, the opening would not lead you to believe that. It is profoundly goofy. It's, it's delightfully sort of on the nose. Uh, but what's so different about Zambot 3 is, uh, A, it has a big emphasis on collateral damage. Uh, so whenever the robots smash up a city, it's not really, like, cleaned up after the fact. Um, it There's a lot of serialized sort of storytelling where episodes will roll into one another. Um, and a major part of it is, like, people die. Uh, you see, like, refugee camps forming, um, and people very much sort of uh, dislike the, the heroes um, as a result because they don't really understand the larger sort of co conflict between the Zambot 3 um, and the, the family that pilots it and the alien forces of the Gaizok. Um, so that's sort of a big change. Um, in terms, and will very much, you know, inform Gundam, the, the sort of first real robot, quote-unquote, show. Uh, child soldiers. Um, like, ch children had piloted robots before, but these ones are particularly young, in case that wasn't obvious. They're like uh, 12, just about. Um, 
uh, and uh, it does kind of tackle bigotry. That, that's a thing that crops up in a few Tomino shows, but the thing about the, the family in Zambot 3 is that they are, they are aliens in the literal sense from the planet Beale. Um, so it does, it does dip its toes into that and racial divisions, which uh, very much informs um, like the space noid, earth noid dynamic in Gundam and that sort of thing. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, Tomino doesn't think very highly of this show, and I think Tomino's wrong on that front, just straightforwardly. If, I, if you guys are going to uh, come out of here and watch any of these shows, um, I think this is the best one. Uh, put, part of that is this, uh, really good animation by the great Yoshinori Kanada, um, whose work informs a lot of the great animators of, of today. Uh, Kanada animated on a number of Studio Ghibli films, including um, Nausicaa, Laputa. A lot of the really great like sequences of aerial combat are handled by him. Um, and he has this wonderfully sort of expressive way of morphing and distorting things in extreme perspective. Um, some, some of Zambot 3 looks kind of crummy, uh, but a lot of it looks very good, um, mostly because there weren't a ton of animators working on it, and a lot of it is Kanada, um, and he's, he's really able to sort of carry the production. Uh, if you guys are fans of Yo Yoshinari, the animator and uh, director, designer, etc., etc., for stuff like Kill la Kill and Panty and Stalking, um, Yo, Yo Yoshinari generally credits Kanada as like one of his biggest influences. Um, and there's a lot of, like, I feel like pooly cooly in terms of aesthetic design. Um, it also has a really big bummer ending, like, like definitely one of the saddest endings in uh, Tomino's filmography. Again, something you would not be able to divine from the opening alone, because uh, that opening is, is very, very peppy. Um, but no, it has like a, I don't know, it has a Zeta Gundam ending, if that means anything to you, um, basically. But I highly recommend it. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, and it's only 23 episodes. That's the best part. Uh, it's, it's short, too. Um, but uh, after this, uh, this show does okay, not not great. Um, again, because it's, it's pretty truncated to a lot of these robot shows at this point in time run for around 50 episodes. Uh, but uh, they give Tomino and Sunrise another chance. Want to see? Daitan Free! so nice to have a break from talking in these things. <laughs> Daitar 3, Invincible Steel Man. A lot of invincibility going on here. Um, uh, the second of those three series that Clover commissions, uh, generally pretty lighthearted. It's very episodic, um, sort of a, a James Bond meets super robot stuff. But uh, it's generally pretty lighthearted, uh, except for the episodes Tomino writes, really. Um, lots, lots of daddy issues. Uh, ben, ben, the main character, Benjo Haran, uh, has a pretty fraught relationship with his father, who is an evil scientist who made uh, humanoid robots um, that are evil and want to destroy everything, as is uh, the case with these things. It's not really a continuous story. I, I do recommend it. Um, same, same with all of these shows, really. Except for Triton, just because you, if, unless you know Japanese, you can't really watch it. Or Italian. There is an Italian dub. Um, but uh, sort of infamously, Daitarn 3, um, like, mostly fun, mostly good fun, extreme downer ending, like right in the middle of no, just straight out of nowhere. Just, these are the last words of the main character, I'm sick of this, uh, after he rejects his father, uh, like his, the ghost of his father's attempt to give him help, he's just like, I'm done, and he just quits, and all of his friends are like, well, Banjo's pouting again. It's, it's very much sort of an author, like, insert for, for Tomino, kind of, um, felt like he was spinning his wheels a little bit with this one uh, at the time, though he looks back on it fondly. Um, uh, like, it's a silly show, more in the vein of the stuff he would do for Tatsunoko, like Yataman, uh, the, their, like, funny comedy haha -ha stuff. Um, except for this episode, uh, which is a big bummer. <laughs> um, uh, he's developing concepts for Gundam here, too, as with all these shows. Um, uh, Korosu uh, is a character designed by... Uh, Tomonori Kogawa, because the, the show had two character designers. Um, uh, Korosu is sort of the standout. She's sort of a, a willowy redhead um, that, in a vast canon of Tomino willowy redheads, um, including likes of like Harulu in Ideon and Matilda and Kaecilia in Gundam. Uh, he just has a real fixation on redheads. She's also loosely based on his wife um, and also tragically dies, as a lot weird amount of characters who are based on his wife tend to do. Alala in Gundam is also kind of based on his wife. Um, he loves his wife to death, too. There's, the reason he's so fashionable in interviews is because he lets his wife dress him, and she's a fashion designer. It's great. Um, uh, Korosu um, very much stands out, again, sort of uh, as a weird sort of empath-type figure. Um, 
a loosely kind of, I would describe her as like a proto Lala Soon. Um, again, based on the same person, his wife. Um, but uh, she's also just a big fan favorite. Like all the fan coverage of the day tends to focus on her more than anything because she's sort of the most interesting character. Uh, but also these things, these dopey looking things, uh, Death Battles, uh, what a cool name. Um, Death Battles are the uh, like support ships, basically. They're, they're uh, basically prototypes for the mobile armors in Mobile Suit Gundam uh, because the, the evil alien or evil cyborg android quote unquote race um, the Meganoids, uh, they turn into the giant robots of the week, sort of a la Power Rangers, uh, where they grow big. Um, but they also have these support, support ships in the death battles, um, which, you know, clear prototypes for what would eventually become stuff like the Big Zom or uh, the Brow Bro, etc., etc. Um, also Meganoid, he, he likes that, like, distinction of, like, Meganoid, Spacenoid, uh, all relating to Humanoid. Um, and it's his first collaboration with two artists, uh, Kunio Okawara and Tomonori Kogoa. And when I say first collaboration, like he worked on other projects with them at Tatsunoko, and he worked with uh, like Yaz at um, on uh, Yamato. But this is the first time he actually like wor worked with them directly uh, as like series chief. Uh, back in the day when he was doing like storyboard work and that sort of thing, he wouldn't have been actively communicating with them in the same way. Um, just to kind of put that one out there, because I, I recognize that he did work on other projects that they were also on. Um, but uh, then, this, this Dytron 3 does well enough. These, these shows do, like, it does better than Zambot anyways. Um, but they're not like huge money makers. Clover doesn't make a lot of money on the toys, is, is the long and short of it. Um, so they let him do one last project. <laughs> And that's how we get here. Uh, several shows later, um, none of which are huge hits. Um, Yoshiki Dimino finally makes Gundam, and it's a huge hit and a big success. No, it flops. Uh, it's a big um, rating stinker. Uh, it has a huge. It has its distinct fan following, particularly in the wake of like Yamato, which was revived with a letter writing campaign. Uh, but Gundam uh, is not a major success, and certainly, most importantly, in terms of like keeping these shows on the air, the toys don't sell worth a shit. Um, so. Uh, what they end up doing uh, is eventually, when enough fans get right in and Bandai takes over, uh, they make movies of them. And the movies are a big hit, a tremendous hit. Uh, you have the Anime New Century Declaration, a whole new generation of animator artists uh, come about because of this silly little robot show, but it wasn't made in a vacuum. Um, it was sort of a culmination of a lot of things. And I guess that's the thesis statement. It's always good to have one of those, I've been told in several writing classes, um, is that it's very much a culmination of it in his influences. And I generally, genuinely recommend you seek out some of his earlier work, um, like even if it's just like looking at his storyboards for stuff, um, or like just production art work. Um, I think Tomino is an interesting guy in case that wasn't readily apparent by the fact that I decided to do a panel on him. Um, but I am at time, so I'm going to end this here and let the folks ahead of me set up shortly. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm more than happy to chat after the panel, obviously, just as soon as I'm done packing up. Thanks. So